<laughs> it's a rare, it's rare to get to introduce a speaker who is also your favorite person, an exceptional colleague, a best friend, and a wife. Um, years ago, I met Laura when DSRP theory was inaccessible, mathematical formalism, unknown to pretty much everybody. And uh, Laura brought her considerable expertise as a translational researcher and her saint-like patience with my quirks to bear on making DSRP accessible to people. It's Laura Cabrera who we have to thank for the fact that these ideas, which were once confined to advanced grad students and researchers, they are now taught to little kids. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Laura. Thank you. <clears throat> me again. Last time, I promise. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yes? Yes. Thumbs up from Greg. Okay. Well, we're about to get to the full throttle of the whole program. Let me just give you a quick overview of some of the ideas that you're going to hear about across the presentation. So many years ago, I began work with a brand new postdoc, Derek Cabrera, on a National Science Foundation. Uh, the primary goal of that project was to, you can't hear me? Yeah, it's on. Start over. Can you hear me? I can hear me. No. Yes? Oh, I bet the cord me. All right. Wow. So many years ago, I began work with a brand new postdoc, Derek Herrera, on the National Science Foundation project. The goal of it was to wed two fields of inquiry, system thinking and program evaluation. And this was done really to help NSF measure the many um, different STEM projects they had across the country, which at the time couldn't be evaluated as a system. And that work was very successful. And it led to a partnership between a theorist and a translational researcher working to increase the public understanding of systems thinking. So today, Derek and I see our audience as pre-K to PhD to professionals. I proposed adding another P to president-elect. They said that wasn't funny, so I said forget it. I won't say it, but then I did. Um, we spent over a decade traveling across the country, across the world, to accomplish the vision we set forth many years ago, which is to engage educate and empower seven billion system thinkers, which might be why we're a little tired some days, but we're still gonna keep going. So in his talk, Derek, Derek really highlighted the need for new thinking to solve wicked problems, but not all wicked problems are of the same large scale as the ones he covered. For many of us, we face wicked problems in the things we struggle with daily, our families, our communities, our workplace, those also can be wicked problems. For example, if you have teenage children, I'm sure some of you do, you know that just keeping them alive, keeping them off of drugs and alcohol, resisting peer pressure, dealing with distorted body images, if you have teenage girls in particular, um, and just the simple act of getting them to prepare for any type of future, these can all be very wicked problems. But with systems thinking, it's possible. So as members of organizations, we all face a, uh, a wide range of wicked problems, things like getting a diverse set of people to share a common vision or trying to survive let, when I'm faced this way, let alone thrive in environments that are unpredictable and always changing. And also developing both analytical skills and emotional intelligence in our students or our colleagues. We started our lab years ago because we really believe that systems thinking is relevant to everyone, both personally and professionally. And we've been fortunate enough to teach systems thinking in a lot of contexts from K-12 education, graduate schools, the Silicon Valley, uh, federal agencies, nonprofits, the military. Um, to say that we've learned a lot would be a massive understatement. So I've reduced it to our top two insights for you today on the things that we've learned in teaching these things to a variety of audiences. First, and importantly, to become a systems thinker, you actually have to unlearn 
a lot of deeply ingrained thinking habits, habits of thinking. Many of us have trouble really escaping the shackles of a lifetime of, in, of implicit and explicit instruction in the traditional thought styles, binary thinking and linear thinking. And as you know, DSRP is a new paradigm of thinking. It's a multivalent form of logic, and it really works on webs of causality. So we need to expand our ways of thinking, and the way to do that is to practice, practice, and practice so that we rewire our neuronal pathways to account for multivalency and nonlinearity in the systems we're dealing with. And given its sophistication and application in its highest levels of research, analysis, and problem solving, it is a bit ironic that it's most easy to teach to preschoolers and elementary students. And that's simply because they learn with greater ease. They haven't been sort of, they haven't sort of been untrained to use their natural tendencies to think systemically yet. They haven't had that tendency dulled yet by the traditional logic that's taught in education. The second thing we've learned uh, is that we really need to communicate to audiences that DSRP system thinking is something that we all are already doing. We're using DSRP to make distinctions, organize ideas into systems, see relationships, and also when we take many different perspectives on an idea. So as I said, the immediate solution for everybody is just to practice thinking about your thinking to develop a metacognitive awareness. And it's important that the degree to which you become a systems thinker is entirely contingent on how self-aware and intentional we are in using these underlying rules. So you're gonna see uh, a variety of pre presentations today and all of them are applying these rules to a variety of problems. So let me just run you through the two minute elevator speech on DSRP. Each DSRP rule contains two co-implying elements. The existence of one element implies the other and vice versa. So the distinctions rule. The two co-implying elements of distinctions are identity and other. We're always identifying things or ideas, and when we do that, we're distinguishing them from other ideas or things. And making distinctions involves drawing boundaries, which is obviously an essential practice for system thinking. Systems, part and whole are the co-implying elements of the systems rule. You can't have one without the other. And we're constantly organizing ideas into systems of part and whole or we're working with the ways other people have organized systems and departmental. It's important also to be aware that anything is simultaneously a part and a whole. Any idea, anything. Relationships. The two co-implying elements of, react of relationships are action and reaction. And we know that anything can be related to another thing, or anything can actually be the relationship between or among other things. So, of course, we won't get very far in understanding systems without also understanding and understanding how the parts of systems are underrelated, or sorry, interrelated. And note also relationships can be direct, indirect, correlational, causal, or simple feedback loops. The fourth and final rule, the perspective rule, states that any idea can be the point or a view of a perspective. So the two co-implying elements are the point, which is the seer, and the view, which is that which is seen. And we must be mindful that it is absolutely impossible to distinguish anything, recognize or identify a relationship, arrange parts and holes in a system without taking a perspective. That's a critical point. So also note that D, S, R, and P occur simultaneously and in no particular order. So let's say you're examining an ecosystem. This involves making a distinction between what is inside and not part of the ecosystem, drawing that boundary, identifying the parts of the ecosystem and organizing them into a larger whole, exploring how the parts of the ecosystem are interrelated, and taking both anthropomorphic and conceptual perspectives on that ecosystem to better understand it. So you can very easily look at this ecosystem from the perspective of a frog or from the perspective of sustainability. And both of those will give you insight into understanding it. So DSRP, it, it really enables you to both construct or deconstruct it, any, um, any system of any level of complexity. 
But the truth is getting started with DSRP is really easy. You just have to pick something you're thinking about and ask yourself four simple questions. One, what are the distinctions I am making when I frame this issue? What are its salient parts? Are there relationships between and among these parts? That I, or are there relationships that I'm not seeing? And finally, what different perspectives could I take on this issue to better understand it? So over time, you become cognizant of the structure of, of your own thinking. And you will acquire a more robust understanding of any issue. You'll get greater mental, mental flexibility when you're thinking about it and be better positioned to address it fully. So I'm going to discuss another outcome of uh, system thinking and DSRP that's critically important and I think we really need to just mention briefly. Simply stated, DSRP really provides the basis for a code of ethics. And we really believe that applying system thinking and DSRP will not only make us better thinkers, it'll make us better humans. And here's how. Conscious distinction making shows us where we choose to focus our attention and what we choose to ignore or marginalize. And awareness of the way we group, we group parts into systems and wholes will promote greater sensitivity while all, also giving us awareness that we are part of systems that will enhance our feelings of belonging and our shared responsibility for each other. When we understand our interrelatedness and the impact we have on other people and the things that we impact, this will redefine our interests away from egocentrism and more towards community. And finally, what could be more ethical than knowing our own cognitive biases um, and how they shape our actions, along with developing an appreciation of le the legitimacy of other people's point of view. I'm going to give you a quick example of something that Derek and I experienced that really drove home this point about the importance of DSRP and its relationship to emotional intelligence. So many years ago, Derek and I were working with um, a large school district in northern Pennsylvania. We were doing an educational study with adjudicated youth. These are kids who are really running out of options. Um, so we worked with uh, a rehabilitation unit for serious offenders, which also was an on-site educational program. We were asked to research whether or not teaching these kids DSRP would raise their test scores, increase their um, social skills development, and reduce behavior issues. So I always remember this moment. Derek and I were, were sitting and observing some of the teaching practices of one of the teachers when a student, he was about a 15 year old boy, raised his hand and with great sincerity and courage, he asked, and he asked his teacher, he said, Mr. Gelb, he said, all of these things that I'm learning right now to understand biology, do you think I could use those in my therapy sessions? Because I think it's helping me understand all of my triggers for my bad behaviors. I really think I'm starting to understand the impact that I've had on my victims and on people around me. So in educational research, that's called FAR transfer, and it's a really significant effect to see. Um, and it's the kind of metacognition that really has payoffs. So for example, when you have this conscious application of DSRP, it leads to a host of both IQ and EQ boosting kind of traits. And that's important because we now know a lot of research has shown that emotional intelligence is one of the most sought after qualities in education, in uh, civic life, and in business. And it's now considered a greater um, determinant of success in any job than just traditional IQ intelligence. So our, human our humanity itself is distinguished by a need to belong to something greater than ourselves, to recognize that we're parts of a larger, larger whole, and to appreciate the interconnectedness among us all. And seeds of these ethical tenets have sprung a long time in systems thinking. But it's not until the four underlying DSRP rules, when practiced together, that we actually can develop metacognition and emotional intelligence. So the more you practice DSRP, the less susceptible you are to the manipulation of your mental models, and the more likely you are to realize your human potential. So as Derek said, this is a unique moment when we're facing enormous, enormous systemic challenges. It's also really unique, though, because we now have the tools to actually democratize systems thinking, to apply it across a wide range of issues. 
And we are entering, as you said, an era that truly begs for a system thinking movie movement in every sector of society, in every institution of society. Because when we understand the systemic patterns of our thinking, we will more closely align our mental models with reality. We will solve bigger problems faster with fewer unintended consequences, innovate solutions that are more useful, will meet the needs of more people with fewer resources, and we will no longer fall prey to our bias, thought errors, gridlock, short-mindedness. I guess in some, we'd all become more effective, efficient, equitable. We'd have a more profound impact on the world. We'd be part of the solutions that we're seeking. And I think this holds true for all of us, the students back there in the back, policymakers, all of the educators in the room, entrepreneurs, activists, business leaders, all of us. So with that, I will thank you for your time.